All right, so continuing, we now um, reached theorem, uh, I think this is in section 7.2. Um, given a geometric surface, there exists a unique function from the surface to the reals such that for every frame field on M, the exterior derivative of the connection form is minus that function times the wedge product of theta 1 and theta 2, the coframe fields. So here we're defining omega 1, 2 in terms of the definition we just studied, and we already know how it works out. If you pick any two frame fields, we know how they relate, right? Um, so, <clears throat> so here's the proof. Um, you know, given frame fields, you know, E1 and E2, um, you know, we define theta 1, theta 2, hence, you know, um, well, and omega 1, 2, a 1 form, right? Thus, d omega 1, 2 has to be equal to some, you know, some function, I'll call it minus k theta 1 wedge theta 2, just because the surface is two-dimensional, all right? So to say, other, to say that there was more than one two-form on the surface would contradict the um, existence of the patches and all that, all right? So like we know from just like the basic calculus of differential forms that d omega 1, 2 is a two-form and omega wedge, uh, theta 1 wedge theta 2 is a two-form, they must be proportional. Let's call that proportionality minus k, all right? And then, but the, the thing that makes this, so like in that respect, this theorem isn't particularly deep, right? It's just saying, yeah, there's one two-form. So if you have a one-form and you can exterior differentiate it, then, you know, it must be proportional to the, to the existing two-form there. Um, of course, it could be that this k is zero, and that's not particularly interesting, but, um, but this is that there exists unique function k, right? So is there just one choice of frame field on the surface? Well, no, there's infinitely many, right? So what if we choose a different frame? Um, for unique, you know, considering uniqueness, well, if E bar 1 and E bar 2 have coframe um, theta bar 1, theta bar 2, and connection form omega bar 1, 2, we um, um, would define d omega bar 1, 2 equals to minus k bar theta 1 bar wedge theta 2 bar, right? We seek to show k is equal to k bar, right? Now, that's our goal here at the moment. So let's see here. We just had lemma 1.4, right? So we know how um, the connection forms and the, um, I mean, let me restate lemma 1.4 using plus minus notation, okay? I'll restate lemma 1.4 using the beloved plus minus notation. So lemma 1.4, what did it say? It said um, theta 1 wedge theta 2 is equal to plus or minus theta bar 1 wedge theta bar 2 and omega bar 1 2 is equal to um, plus or minus omega 1 2 parentheses uh, plus d phi. All right, so let's 
Mm-hmm. Well, they could be different frames. I mean, point-wise, they're you know, different. I get that. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, like, I mean, and they can be different in kind of interesting ways over the totality of the surface. Like, okay. for example, take the plane. Yeah. Um, if you take any um, set of curves which intersect each other orthogonally, that would define an orthogonal frame field on the plane. But you see the way that that orthogonal frame field is related to the just plain Cartesian frame field on the plane? It's rather intricate and complicated and different. I, can see that. I mean, at any point, you can just take the Cartesian frame and like rotate it into the, the curve frame, but like. I don't know. I'm not responding to an actual question you asked. I'm just, <laughs> I'm conjecturing a question that. <laughs> no, it's just, I just, I, I just was way too intuitive to me. Ah, well. It's like, all right, mm -hmm. so we got E1 and E2, and our cup runs theta 1, theta 2, and so we're going to draw all the form, we're going to find omega 1, 2 of this. <laughs> right, right. Ah, uh, see, I think, I mean, hmm. right. well, that's what we're about to see, so your intuition's right. <laughs> so this is plus or minus d omega 1, 2, right? Because this d squared is 0. But what was d omega 1, 2? Well, that is, um, well, plus or minus minus k theta 2, which we could write as minus plus k theta 1, which theta 2, right? But then I want to, I'm, I'm trying to, um, go back to the bars, you know. I've grown weary of this marker. Um, and this is minus plus k times plus or minus um, theta bar 1 wedge theta bar 2. But what happens when you take minus times plus or plus times minus, you just get minus, right? So we just get minus k theta bar 1 which theta bar 2. But this was also by definition equal to minus k bar theta bar 1, which theta bar 2, right? So comparing those two expressions, what do we learn? We learned that if this is equal to that, it follows that k bar is equal to k which shows you it's immaterial which frame we use to calculate the Gaussian curvature. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter. Our choice of frame field on the surface cannot affect our calculation of the Gaussian curvature. Well, that makes sense because then we prove the Gaussian curvature would stay the same. We prove, yeah, we prove the Gaussian curvature would stay, would be invariant under a local isometry, but um, Keep in mind at the moment, that Gaussian curvature we had defined um, in terms of the, in, the uh, inherited, uh, the induced geometry from three dimensions. Basically, restriction of the Euclidean geometry of three dimensions to surfaces. Right? Yeah, this, is Th this is abstract. We are now building the framework to define the Gaussian curvature independently of the shape operator. There is no shape operator here. 
Now, so just to recap, the um, essential equations we have here are the one I just wrote. And um, ooh, I hope I was on that. <laughs> I just erased everything I just did. I like hope I hope I was actually like yeah, I was looking, okay. <laughs> All right, so um you know just to recap, our equations are d theta, d theta one equals omega one two, wedge theta two, and d theta two equals omega two one, wedge theta one, which you could all alternatively write as omega one two, wedge theta one, one of the minus. Then finally, d omega 1, 2 is equal to minus k theta 1 wedge theta 2. So these equations, we use these to define, you know, omega 1, 2 and the Gaussian curvature. Now, I think um, a wise thing for me to do at the moment would be to shift back to the projectors to show you examples. All right. So let me gear that up. We're on lecture 24, right? <laughs> it's upside down. So one of, one of the things I claimed earlier um, before I erased the middle um, board was that we could use the warping functions e f and g to like define a metric by extending bilinearly what we're about to look at is the formula which shows you explicitly how that goes so if you've got a a surface and um you know, it has, so it has a patch, right? Which means that XU and XV are linearly independent at each point because it's regular map. And so those form a basis for the tangent space. And so if you can define, I'm sorry, it's okay. If you can define the formula, you can define a formula for that basis, like, like I have up here. Um, You put it into the full screen mode. I think it looks better that way. <laughs> now I can't see. So, come on. So I'm defining, what I'm saying is, if you want to define the inner product of these two vectors on the abstract surface, with you know partial velocities x u and x v, then really all you need to know is how to define this one and that one and that one. Notice if we know that x u and x u is one and x v and v is zero and x v and v is one, then that's the formula, right? But take a step back here. This formula actually, more generally, instead of putting a one here, we should just put e. We should put f. We should put g, right? If I give you E, F, and G, then this formula shows you how you can define the uh, metric on the surface using the warping functions. But anyway, um, so I'm about to use E equals to 1, F equals to 0, and G equals to 1 to define a non-standard metric on the torus. All right. Now, this is not the torus we've talked about before. 
because, right, so like, I guess before I even get to that, first things first, the plane, right? The plane has frame field u1, u2. Come on. Come on. My laser. What's happened to my laser? The frame has um, u1, u2, you know, the Cartesian frame. The coframe is dx, dy. And um, so d theta 1 is 0, d theta 2 is 0. That means omega 1, 2 is 0, which means d omega 1, 2 is 0, which means that the Gaussian curvature is 0. So the plane has curvature 0. Wonderful. So this is, now this is where it gets weird. So the torus as parameterized is it, well, it's still a surface in three dimensions. We haven't gone away from that yet, right? But the torus is parameterized by this patch, right? We can define a metric on the torus by saying this is one, that is zero, that is one. That defines what's called T zero. And the torus with this metric um, has curvature zero because the, um, the patch is, is actually an isometry from the plane to the torus. And since the curvature of the plane is zero, the curvature of the torus is zero. But we could also just calculate directly, you know. Um, but anyway, if you give the torus this, the metric defined by these, then it is, it's flat. That's weird, right? Because the torus <laughs> in three dimensions is not flat in terms of what? In terms of the natural geometry inherited for three dimensions, it's definitely not flat, right? The torus has like positive curvature on the outside. It's got negative curvature on the in inside in, in pre-chapter seven terminology. But that torus that we were talking about before is the torus where your, you know, your geometry is coming from the Euclidean geometry of R3 restricted to the torus. This metric, we just made up from the thin, you know, from, from, from nothing. We said, okay, we're going to define the metric on the torus by these relations. That metric gives you flat geometry on the torus. Torus is like a what? Like, how, how does that change like the, the image of the torus unless there's like an abstract space? It's an, it changes the notion of geometry on the torus. It doesn't change, the, the torus is the torus. It's that set of points. Uh -huh. But this changes how we would calculate like distance between points uh -huh. and like angles between vectors on the torus, all that kind of stuff. Um, like I said, T0 is a subset of R3. However, the metric is not induced from the Euclidean metric on R3. Um, and, um, you know, that's why it doesn't fly in the face of those theorems that we saw in section 6.3, because those are theorems for induced geometries. Those are all theorems for surfaces where the geometry, the curvature is calculated in terms of the shape operator, which is connected deeply to the Euclidean geometry of the three dimensions, which the surface is embedded in. These abstract surfaces, we're divorcing the geometry of the surface from the geometry of R3 in which it's embedded. Um, so, let's see if I have another example. Well, this is more of a, more of a sort of a, uh, an example of examples. <laughs> but um, here, another nice way to, do, on R2, you can take the, um, the new metric to be the dot product divided by a, a scale factor squared, a ruler function squared. Um, the first day of class, we looked at this, not for all of the plane, but for the upper half plane, and we had h equal to y squared. That gave us that punk rate plane we looked at with all the weird, you know, half circle, half circle uh, geodesics and the, the vertical line geodesics, remember? Um, <clears throat> So more generally, if you, instead of just putting a y here, if you put um, just any positive function h there, then that, you can prove that that defines a metric. 
And um, again, it's being defined using this, um, this idea that we're saying, well, what this says is that E and G are both 1 over H squared, and um, F is equal to 0. Um, let me expand on that. I don't want to be so vague about what I'm saying. Um, let me just be real explicit about what I'm saying right here. So I'm saying that we're giving the plane this non-standard geometry. How would you parameterize the plane? No, just like as a surface, like R2, what's the, what's the patch? Yeah. So I would point out here like X, you could say X is a mapping from R2 to R2. Right? And so the formula XUV is, watch for it, UV. <laughs> All right? So in this case, XU and XV are just 1, 0 and 0, 1 respectively. And so this finangled new metric we're defining on um, you know, vectors like AXU, let me, let me do it like the other slide I had, AXU plus BXV comma CXU plus DXV, all right? The warping function new metric works like this. You do, let me just show you why. So this has to be A X U X U, well A C X U X U plus um, A D plus B C X U X V plus B D X V X V. I'm writing more than I need to for this example because I want to communicate to you guys the general idea. So you got a patch, you calculate partial velocities. If you specify what this, this, and this are, it defines a metric. If you write this formula, this formula builds the bilinearity into it. It builds the symmetry into it. So there are certain conditions you need on E, F, and G in order for it to make sense. I forget what they are right off the hand, top of my head, but um, that's it. So like, the thing is, this, if, if f is equal to zero, right? So if f equals to zero, and e equals to g equals to one over h squared, then the inner product of like, you know, a comma b with c comma d in this wild, funky new world is 1 over h squared ac plus 1 over h squared bd. But that is literally 1 over h squared times ab dot product with cd. So that, that's what's being said in this example, is that defining the metric by specifying the warping functions are 0 for f and 1 over h squared for e and g, it just amounts to taking the usual, usual Euclidean dot product of vectors and dividing by this ruler function squared. That's all it is. But that's um, really quite a trip because it gives you something quite interesting that I have on the projector right now. It gives you a, a plane, a non-Euclidean plane, you see? 
it gives you a plane with a different metric if h is not equal to 1. And that different metric, more interestingly still, you can straight calculate the Gaussian curvature and it's given by this monstrosity. Second partial derivatives with respect to u and v of the ruler function and then that other term. Now that turns out to be h squared times the Laplacian of the log of h. That's what I was going to ask about that. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the Laplacian, which is um, explained more down here. But um, the, the calculation is right here. It's, uh, <laughs> and you're like, wait, 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 hold, hold on, flag on the play. <laughs> Whoa, but this is chapter six. How are we using that? The reason we're allowed to use that is in chapter six, we derived that formula on the back of what? On the back of the adapted frame, where what? Where our omega one, two, and our Gaussian curvature satisfied the first and second structural equations. Those first and second structural equations have now been elevated to definitions, but they're still true. In other words, the logic of chapter six still follows through to that orthogonal patch section. The formula is still, the formula is true for geometric surfaces, not just for surfaces embedded in R3, because the arguments we used in chapter six actually were not arguments in three dimensions. They were arguments for adapted frame fields, which is really the, the, the province of geometric surfaces. He's just trying to break in nicely. Like he could have sort of like, taken about half of chapter six and put it past chapter seven because it's really chapter seven thinking. But anyway, this is the calculation. And so cool, I mean, that's the formula for the Gaussian curvature. Now, if the Poincare plane, see, we can do the Poincare plane with this because the Poincare plane that we talked about day one had ruler function y. h was equal to y. So what does that work out to if h is equal to y? In other words, h is equal to v. How does this formula simplify? If we put h equal to v, what survives? Well, these are gone, right? Yeah, I think it's just, just that right there. So it shows you, you can see quickly from this formula that the Gaussian curvature of the Poincare plane we did day one is minus one as negative curvature. Which I think is kind of neat, but I think it would also be instructive for us to um, go back to that Poincare plane and um, find a frame field on it and go through the calculus, see how it works, you know. Here's that Laplacian. The Laplacian is the, um, see Laplacian is second partial of the variable plus the second partial variable squared. I mean, it's the second derivative plus the second derivative of the function involved. So when you take second derivatives of the log, you get derivatives of one over h times that. But then the product rule picks up those two terms in the previous expression. Is this the same guy that the Laplace transform? No. Well, is the Laplace transform the same as the Laplacian? Yes, that's probably the same Laplace. Laplace did a lot of things, yeah. I think that's, that's, that's likely, yeah. All right, so um, I tell you, the, the examples, the, um, there's a lot more that could be done with that previous discussion, all right? Um, another thing you can define, so um, this is the so-called stereographic sphere. Um, you, you let the sphere rest on the xy plane like this. Uh, and then you can define a mapping from that sphere to the xy plane, um, the so-called stereographic projection by running a line from the north pole, which you delete from the sphere, okay? That's not actually part of this, this sphere. So the north pole's out. Everything else is there, though. So you run a, a line from the north pole to the plane. And whatever point it intersects on that sphere, that point is mapped to the point on the plane. Another example would be... Um, Let's see here. Well, I guess it feels like the North Pole gets mapped to the South Pole. 
I guess the South Pole maps to itself in this, in this, in this, yeah. Yeah, I think that, well, the South, the South Pole, the South Pole is the case, is the place where the P and the P of P come together. Um, but um, in any event, here are formulas. There's the straight up formulas for the stereographic projection. Um, the South Pole would have equation um, 0, 0, 0, I think. So, because that's the origin, I say. I say the center is at 0, 0, 1, which means that the South Pole is at the origin. So if you put 0, 0, 0 into here, we get 0, which is what I was saying. Um, but there's the, the formula for it. And it, there's a derivation on page 167, um, which, you know, if I had an hour of class to burn, I think it would be fun to go through. Um, so the, the, the larger point here is that this is a mapping of surfaces. It's a mapping from the sphere resting on top of the plane to the plane. All right? And, um, and you could just as well define the inverse from the plane up to the sphere. All right? Um, here's some calculations going through that. Who cares? I mean, apparently I did when I wrote that, but. <laughs> so continuing, if we take that mapping, right, and we pull the Euclidean metric on the plane, all right, back to the Poncre sphere using the, the stereographic projection map, and the pullback metric thing I wrote over there, then that's a local isometry of the Euclidean plane to the sphere. Which, and so what, is that, what does that tell you, though, about if we, pull the, if we pull the metric on the plane back to the sphere under that p-mapping, what's the curvature of the resulting geometry on the sphere? It has to be the same as the curvature of the Euclidean plane. Euclidean plane, not, not the, not the Poincaré plane we talked about just recently. Euclidean plane has E equal to 1, F equal to 0, G equal to 1. So when you go back to that formula we had for Gaussian curvature, it's 0. Because it's all, it's all derivatives of the warping function. So if the warping functions are all constant, Gaussian curvature, 0. I mean, and, and, and certainly the plane has an orthogonal patch, which I wrote over there. So Gaussian curvature of the Euclidean plane is zero. If we give the pullback metric to the sphere, it also has curvature zero. Um, how does the sphere have curvature zero? Exactly. How? Because we're not giving it the geometry of the sphere, of the Poincaré sphere with the pullback metric. It's not the intrinsic geometry inherited from the shape operator in three dimensions. It is the geometry pulled back from the stereographic projection mapping to make the local geometry on the sphere flat. It will, yes, exactly. <laughs> student, student is doing this as appropriate response to this, yes. Especially at the fourth hour of a four hour once a week class. Um, my apologies, <laughs> we've got to the most mind bending thing in the whole semester right now. I know, it's messed up, right? I know it does, but the thing is, we proved last time that a local isometry, uh -huh. remember, it, it, the curvature is maintained. And we have, we're defining the pullback metric so that it is a local isometry. So whatever the curvature is that you're pulling back has to be the curvature that you get on the new, newly defined space, in this case, the sphere. Are we in abstract space, though? It, it is an abstract space in the sense that it is the point set of the sphere. You know, the unit sphere centered at one zero, 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 1 with radius 1. But that's where it stops. I mean, it is not the geometry which you inherit yeah. from three dimensions okay, there. I can kind of see that then. Right. But there's something else messed up. You could go the other way. You could take the, the usual inherited intrinsic geometry 
not intrinsic, but the, um, the induced geometry on the sphere. So if we just study the sphere as a subset of R3, we have proved a couple times in here that the curvature is 1 over R squared. Right, in, in this case it would be 1. Oh wait, and then you, you're saying that the metric of a, it would push it to, you could, this is a localized geometry, you're saying you that could, R2 would be curvature 1. Then. That's right, you could take, the, exactly, you go the other way, you could take the, the, the stereographic projection and play this game the other direction. You could take the inverse mapping to the stereographic projection and pull it back from the sphere, back to the plane, have a curvature 1 plane. See, the plane with different non-standard metrics can be given all kinds of interesting geometries. It's just that they're not the geometry which is the one we know and love and, and are most familiar with from the dot product on R2. It's something else. Now that claim, the claim that was made in passing earlier that you didn't appreciate at the time was that all of those different geometries on the plane can be realized as like this ruler function thing. Like they can all be written as the dot product divided by an appropriate ruler function. That, that's above our pay grade in here to prove that, but that's, that's a claim. Um, Yeah. <laughs> well, like, I, I, get, I get everything you just said, but I don't, like... I know, I know. So we're just talking, like, I should just, like, get out of my head that, like, that geometry and the way we define it in, like, real world is not the geometry, it's just mathematics of this particular metric system. Right. Yeah, that, exactly. You don't expect it to be the geometry which is familiar to you from, like, intuition. Yeah. You have to build a new intuition for these things. Um, Another example is the Poincaré disk model of Poincaré's plane. This is different than the one we looked at at the start of the semester. There's actually multiple versions, there are multiple models of that hyperbolic space that we looked at at the start of the semester. Another one is the disk, like the Euclidean disk, <laughs> um, of radius 2. So like a, the disk radius 2 in the usual sense, and they're defining the... Um, you know, non-Euclidean geometry by this dot product divided by h squared, where h is what? Um, yeah, it's, it wouldn't be, it's not 2, it's something, oh, it's this! Yowzers! So this is much more, this is much, much nastier than what we did at the start of the semester. See that? Look at the ruler function. What happens to that ruler function on the disk? Uh, so we're talking about disk of radius 2, right? Yeah. So as you get to the edge of the disk, what happens to h? It goes to when u squared plus v squared is 4, we get 1 minus 4 over 4. It goes to 0, right? So that means that as you approach the edge of the disk, it takes, it's further and further and further out. So like the edge of the disk is infinity in this scenario. And the center of the disk, it's like normal. That's where h is 1. So the ruler function is sort of, the rulers are getting shorter and shorter and shorter as you go further and further and further out, getting to the edge of the disk. Just like in our Poincaré half-plane model, the ruler was getting shorter and shorter and shorter as you got close to the x-axis. So this is kind of the same idea, but instead of approaching the x-axis, it's going vertical, it's going out to the edge. And um, <clears throat> in this case, you can calculate the Gaussian curvature using that like awesome formula from a couple slides ago, right? And what will you get if you try to take those? See, the partial derivatives are interesting for this one. Yeah. yeah? And when you do them, you get minus 1, just like our half plane. This is another model of hyperbolic space with constant curvature minus 1, but quite different looking. And if you looked at the geodesics in this thing, they wouldn't be half circles and vertical lines. They'd be something else. May well, maybe they're half circles. I don't know. I'm just saying. Oops. So, yeah. Do I have more here about this? Uh, Oh, here I calculated the length of a radial line in this hyperbolic, um, 
I call it, well, he, I guess he calls it the hyperbolic plane. Um, so the length of this. <laughs> um, so there's a parameterization of that line. And you calculate the length. Um, uh, let's see here. The length is this, it's supposed to be, oh, this is a 1 over h squared, right? And it's the dot product, dot product of this with itself, divided by h squared and square rooted, which works out to this, which anyway apparently is that. And so when you integrate that, you get an inverse hyperbolic tangent, um, which, fun fact, is equal to the natural log of the quotient, like so. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that approaches. As, as, t, as t approaches minus 2, that th the length of this with respect to the geometry we're describing is infinite. Yeah, oh, that makes sense because that's what we yeah. Even though, of course, you can see as plain as day, intuition, that is a line segment of length 2 in Euclidean terms. But in the... No, but your ruler keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Right. Because the ruler, exactly. On the flip side of things, what's interesting is that it is also a conformal kind of thing in the sense that the angle, it's conformally related to the Euclidean geometry because the angle between paths which meet in the space is the same as the angle in the Euclidean backdrop. Well, you know, this There's the proof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Zeno's Zeno's paradox. Yeah, yeah, it's like that. It's essentially like that. Right. It's like you can only try, and because you know your half steps are getting infinitesimally smaller. Right, right. Now this, I will tell you, this proposition, I read it and I go, huh, and then I read it again and I go, huh, and I go, oh, fine, I'll move on. I go to the next page, I look at the example, I'm like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> um, this is a kind of sneaky other way to make it. <laughs> To, to define a metric, and its whole point really is to apply to this projective plane example. So, <laughs> um, projective plane is is more abstract than anything else we talked about. It's actually the points in the projective planes. Projective plane you can think about either as lines through the origin, a line through the origin. Is a projective is a point in the projective plane, or you could think about it in terms of where that line intersects the sphere, and in a line through the origin will end, intersect the sphere in antipodal points, p and minus p. So that that p and minus p go together, that makes a point in the projective plane. And with respect to that notion, you can define a metric on it because um, the antipodal map satisfies the regular regu regularity condition of the previous proposition that I was saying is kind of murky. And in so doing, you can define a metric on the um, projective plane. And I think it is got, it, so this is a way to give the projective plane curvature one for what it's worth. But um, eh, we're kind of low on time here. So I think I'm going to move along. Our last example for today is tangent surfaces. I had a homework problem on this. I think I worked it out. And um, this one's kind of cool in the sense that this is an example for us of a surface in n dimensions. All right. And we're, we're going to see how to calculate the curvature of it. And it's not that hard. So the tangent surface, you just take a curve, which I've used beta, a unit speed curve. All right, and then the um, parameterization just says at each point along the curve, uh, just use the um, the tangent direction to define another. Uh, you know that, that you just keep extending by the tangent direction at each point, and um, it gives you a tangent surface. Now. Um, you do need the, um, I think you need the Frenet curvature, the magnitude of T prime to be positive, otherwise this doesn't work. Um, like if, if that's not positive, then it's too boring. Like if you tried to build the tangent surface from a line 
things would go badly for you. Uh, so you need, you need a surface which is, you need a curve which is interesting enough that it's going in different tangent directions at different points. Otherwise it's not, you know, something like a, I don't know, like a helix or something would be nice. But anyway, so here's the parameterization, the so-called tangent surface. And um, so you can calculate xu and xv. There they are. And so um, he says e is xu dot xu, f is xu dot xv, and g is 1. So um, he's just defining um, e, f, and g. The, he's going to use these to define the metric on the surface. All right. So we plug those into the formula I wrote on the other board, and that defines the, the metric on the surface. And it, this is the condition which is needed between eg and f. It, you needed the eg minus f squared was positive, but in this case, eg minus f squared works out to v squared k squared, and um, that's positive, so assuming that v is not equal to zero, which is required, because v is the speed, which is the unit. Oh wait, a minute. v is not this. Wait a minute. Oh, v is not the speed here. V is the parameter. Yes. So we're just we're ruling the v equal to zero out. Um, fine. And um, so there you go. Um, if this is e and f and g, then um, let's see here. What's the uh, what's the curvature? So I say exercise number 13 in section 5.4 on page 233 shows the surface so constructed and R3 is flat. And here for Rn, we have the same formulas for E, F, and G. Thus, as K determined by E and G, e and G it follows K is equal to zero for this example as well. I'm not entirely convinced by that, but um, hmm. how could we prove... Well, I don't know, maybe if I have some time, I'll try to add some detail to this calculation before next week. But anyway, so next week, there's no test. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that'd be crazy. You guys are behind a little bit. Um, but on the other hand, um, we're kind of running out of semester. So I think the week, the test after has to be the week after that, pretty much, right? Um, so hopefully next week, I will finish up what I have to say about... Um, geodesics and um, leading to the gauss bonnet theorem. And so we'll hopefully see that next week and um, try to pick out some homework problems on this stuff that, you know, helps you to kind of see it. But um, hopefully not too much because I can't really afford much more than one more mission past the one I've already assigned. So I'll probably try to pick like five problems from chapter, what is it? Yeah, maybe, maybe eight problems from chapter six and eight problems from chapter seven, something like that. Like, I can't do quite as much as the previous ones, but anyway, thanks, guys.